what do we mean or what does it mean uh, to employ my will to do something? Or is will something that I can employ? Uh, does will employ me? What exactly do we mean by this term? A word we use all the time without giving it a second thought. I want to show that this much used and sometimes abused word is far more mysterious and complicated than we typically assume. Now, there's two fundamentally opposed conceptions of will that persist to this day, which also makes the concept extremely uh, confusing. One of these views will as synonymous with desire, which for the most part would be unconscious. The other views will as synonymous with the ego the rational part of our minds. We'll explore both of these conceptions in depth today and see where that takes us. So I'll begin with the conventional definition of will that most people today typically embrace. It goes something like this. Will is the faculty of the mind that selects at the moment of decision a desire among the variety of desires at my disposal. Will itself doesn't refer to a particular desire, but rather the mechanism responsible from choosing from among this or that desire. So that's a fairly generic definition, which you would find in most dictionaries if you were to look up the word will. According to this definition, to will is to select. It's an executive function of the mind, always at our disposal, which puts us, so to speak, in the driver's seat. I can will this way or that, yes or no. And via my will, I can make my desires come true. The more I exercise my will, the more successful I am likely to be in the pursuit of my goals. All it takes is to will it so. The more will or willpower, the better. Do some people have more will than others? Is this what accounts for success in life? The person with the most willpower wins. Now there's some innumerable problems with this notion of the will. First, it implies that by force of will, I deliberately choose or select from among my desires, which one I decide to pursue. Then poof, I pursue it. I more or less will my desire to come true. A second problem is the premise that I have a good deal of control over my will. After all, if I employ will to achieve my desires, then I'm always ahead of my actions, always one step ahead of my desires, in control. In fact, neither of these assumptions is persuasive. Will is not necessarily or always conscious. I'm never really in control of my will, nor do I select from among my desires which one I will opt for. My desires choose me. How could we be so wrong about something so basic and ostensibly commonsensical? How could we be so confused about what this simple word means? We often say, where there is a will, there is a way. Yes, but what is will? Aristotle suggested that will may be voluntary or involuntary, but argued that some people are better at it than others. Following Plato, Aristotle implied that no one chooses to do wrong, for example. They simply don't know 
that they're choosing badly out of ignorance. So the key to the right use of will, according to Aristotle, is measured by the wisdom employed in that decision. Aristotle believed that the wise person always chooses rightly. In addition to wisdom, Aristotle also valued self-mastery. This may be where we got the idea that we're capable of becoming masters of our will, or potentially so. This notion has survived to the present day. The belief that we employ will in order to do right was a popular idea among the classical philosophers. A few centuries later, St. Augustine, who brought many of Aristotle's ideas into Christianity, refers to will as, quote, the mother and guardian of virtue. This implies that it is up to our will to be good Christians. Now, in the early modern philosophical period, attention turned to whether will is or is not free. The term free will was introduced as distinct from will itself, as though one kind is free and the other isn't. Philosophers such as Hobbes, Spinoza, Locke, and Hume rejected this argument and attributed this misrepresentation to a verbal confusion. They concluded that all will is free. This opens the door to whether will is entirely conscious and what we mean by the word free. This is relevant to the question of ethics and the degree to which we are free to do good instead of harm. In the modern era, the 19th century German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, was the first philosopher to situate the will in the unconscious and to equate it with desire. His thesis fundamentally changed the way we conceptualize the nature of will and whether it is something we can or cannot control. Schopenhauer's most famous remark about will goes something like this, quote, you can do as you will, but you cannot will as you will. So in other words, once you've had a desire, yes, you may choose to enact it, but you cannot choose your desire. With this comment, Schopenhauer boldly claims that we have no control over our will or what he is calling our desire. Rather, our desire controls us. He abandons the executive function of the will and situates it within a maelstrom of feelings, desires, and inclinations. When we become truly conscious of ourselves, says Schopenhauer, we realize that our essential qualities are comprised of endless urging, craving, striving, wanting, and desiring. All these are characteristic of what Schopenhauer calls the will. Whereas his predecessors thought that will depends on knowledge and the deliberate execution of our conduct, Schopenhauer argued that our will is primary and uses knowledge in order to satisfy its cravings. Ironically, Schopenhauer concluded that this means we are not free because our actions are determined by our will, which according to Schopenhauer, is synonymous with desire. Because we're at the mercy of our desires, we have no way of controlling them, no matter how hard we try. You only have to look at the drug addict to be persuaded of this thesis. Nietzsche was profoundly influenced by Schopenhauer's conception of the will, but he didn't embrace Schopenhauer's pessimism. Nietzsche claimed that his entire philosophy was encapsulated in the simple motto, will to power, an expression you've probably heard. It's an enigmatic phrase that has no precise definition. But I interpret the words will to power 
to mean desire to passion, meaning that we are creatures of our desires. We may desire many things in life, but according to Nietzsche, the grandest and most essential is to the desire to live passionately. This is not a game for the timid. Nietzsche was nothing if not passionate. The notion that we can exercise control over our desires was the furthest thing from his mind. Unlike Schopenhauer, Nietzsche equates desire with freedom. The fact that we have no control over our desires is precisely what makes them free. This raises the question, well, who am I? My desires or my capacity for rational thinking, my ego? Nietzsche embraced the former. Our desires do not and not, cannot control me because I am my desires, the seat of my agency and selfhood. What could be more personal than what I want from life? I'm now gonna to turn to the 20th century father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Freud was profoundly influenced by both Schopenhauer's and Nietzsche's respective conceptions of the will. Unlike Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, Freud situated the will in the conscious portion of the mind, the ego. Yet, like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, Freud conceives our desires, what he terms libido or the id, as the raison d'etre of our existence firmly lodged in our unconscious. He equates the relation between our will and our desire as analogous to a rider on a horse. The horse is our id or desire and knows where it wants to go. The rider, our ego or will, tries his best to guide the horse where the rider wants to go, but is not always successful in doing so. In order to get along, they have to compromise. The happy person has come to terms with his desires and tries his best to serve them by not getting in their way. The neurotic doesn't trust his desires and tries his best to suppress them out of fear. Freud is sometimes accused of favoring the rational part of the mind over the passions that drive us. But it isn't that simple. Like Schopenhauer, Freud is pessimistic about the degree to which we can be in harmony with our desires. But he, has, he was no cognitive psychologist. The worst thing we can do, says Freud, is to repress our desires. The happy person recognizes them as her master and devotes her life to serving them. Psychoanalysis was intended to serve that very purpose, to give our desires more liberty in the conduct of our lives. Our will can either serve our desires or obstinately suppress them, more often than not, the latter. So what does this say about freedom and the will? What role does our rational mind play in achieving happiness? if not to guide and control our desires. Moreover, what are the implications for psychotherapy? Do we employ conscious will to make changes in our lives or to simply discover what we're up to? Which makes more sense to equate will with desire or as the arbiter of our desires? And where do we locate choice? Is it a function of the ego, our rationality, or is it a function of desire, which would render choice an unconscious activity? For the answer to these questions, I wanna turn our attention to the 20th century existentialist philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, and the clinical perspective of R.D. Lang who was profoundly influenced by Sartre's philosophy. What difference does it ultimately make how we characterize the function of will, whether we equate it with desire 
or whether we equate it with rationality, with the ego, as long as we're clear on how we define their respective functions. We know that human beings are driven by passion, the seat of emotions and desire, and have a capacity for rationality that serves as a kind of agent for our passions and a judge of appropriate action. Let's suppose that our passions are the seat of our desires and the ego is the seat of will, our capacity for rational judgment, and that they sometimes work in harmony and sometimes they're opposed. We'll agree with Sartre that human beings are fundamentally free and that their behavior is not determined by external causes or their genetic structure or even the mystification employed by their families and society. This means that all of our actions are free, that every feeling, ambition, and attitude are the consequence of my free choice. Even though these choices are not governed by my will, but by my desires. Though separated by an enormous gulf in theory, temperament, and vocation, Freud and Sartre would have agreed that our choices are free, but not willful. Rather, our choices are instigated by our desires. Freud would say that I render my choices unconsciously, whereas Sartre would argue that the choices are conscious, but on a pre-reflective level, so I'm not really aware of them at the time. I only become aware of the choices I make after having made them. In both cases, it wasn't my ego or I that chose the action. The so-called conscious choice merely makes it official after the fact. This means that I can never really get ahead of my choices, that I'm always one step behind them guiding me this way or that. This explains why I often don't know why I choose this over that, because my choices are not rational. This is why psychoanalysis is retrospective and not prophylactic. Only in behavioral psychology do we play the fiction of deliberating what we intend to do and then execute the act. In psychoanalysis, the idea is to review previous actions and learn something about ourselves from them. The actions under review may be buried in our childhoods, or they may have occurred moments earlier in the analytic session. In either case, we're not talking about an executive function of the mind, but a reflective one. Now, this has led some to conclude that Freud's conception of the unconscious was deterministic. If we don't make our choices consciously, which is to say voluntaristically, then our choices must be made for us by our unconscious. This implies there is no free choice in the matter if the choice isn't willfully executed. This conclusion is rooted in a misconception about the nature of choice and whether we have conscious control over our decisions. We know from Freud's horse and rider analogy that it is the horse that drives the rider, not the other way around. Just because my choices are free doesn't mean I'm in control of them. Freedom doesn't turn me into Superman. It doesn't make me omnipotent. My free choice isn't the freedom to dominate or overpower. It is a freedom to be me and to embrace the me that I am, warts and all. Sartre suggests that our neuroses go all the way back to a fundamental choice in our childhood when we chose what our neurosis would be on an unconscious pre-reflective level. This means that we intend our psychopathology. We're not the consequence of this or that trauma. Nothing caused my condition or made me be the way that I am. Rather, I chose to experience this or that incident 
as traumatic. I'm ultimately responsible for who I am and how I became who I am. Given this thesis, how is therapy even possible? If I cannot will myself to help, then how does change come about? When I asked R.D. Lang this question in one of my supervision sessions with him, he answered with one word, indirectly. All my conscious knowing mind is good for in therapy is to acquaint myself with the mysterious nature of my existence and to plumb its depths over an indeterminate amount of time. I cannot will myself to overcome the fear of intimacy. I cannot compel myself to love more generously, to behave more compassionately, or to feel more alive. Yet all of these dilemmas often improve as a consequence of the therapeutic endeavor to know ourselves. How? We don't know exactly. All we do know is that going all the way back to the Doric Elf Oracle's command to know thyself, that knowing oneself has the potential to change our lives forever, to finally become who we are authentically. So how has behavioral psychology and more recently cognitive behavioral therapy approached the role of will in the therapeutic process. Psychology and its endeavor to appear more scientific than philosophy equates will with volition. Following the Stoics, behavioral psychologists situate the will in the conscious portions of the mind and insist that all our choices are driven by rationality, not by desire. According to this thesis, my will has the ability to decide upon and commit to any course of action. It isn't my desire that prompts me to make this or that choice, but rational thought processes. Will is defined as a purposive striving and is one of four primary psychological functions, along with affect, motivation, and cognition. Volition and willpower are viewed as the same thing. In behavioral therapy, you decide to accomplish a task, such as overcoming the fear of flying, and over time, you will yourself to overcome this fear by recognizing that your fear is irrational. Does this work? Yes and no. As with other therapies, some people improve and others do not. But according to Lang, what probably helps CBT patients to actually change anything is always a function of their desire, not their will. They just don't know it and attribute their successes to willful engagements with their problems. According to Lang, it was probably the relationship with a therapist that eventually provided the desire to affect change, not willfully, but indirectly, which is to say, unconsciously. Lang was a committed existentialist and synthesized Freud's and Sartre's respective perspectives by situating our selfhood and our desires instead of our ego, which is essentially another word for character traits. This limits the function of the will to an agent of synthesis and repression, a view that was also embraced by Jacques Lacan. So how does this perspective show up in the context of the clinical situation? For a perfect example of how Lang believed that successful behavior always follows one desire rather than the will, let's take a look at the drug addict. The addict may feel that he should stop drinking or drugging because he should, or because it's destroying his life. But unless he genuinely wants to, he will fail. The will is an executive function 
that can either serve desire or oppose it. When in opposition, the person is in conflict with his desire, but if he tries to control it with his will, the result will be haphazard. The addict tells himself that he needs to get in control of his addiction as though he can steel himself against his desire to drink or eat too much by a force of will. That is his dilemma, an obstinate refusal to genuinely want to give up this or that drug or behavior, but to rely instead on an interjected parent to make him do so. According to Lang, this never really works. Yes, you can live your life that way, getting off and then back on the wagon, in and out of rehab, AA meetings, and so on, but without ever really giving it up, both protecting the desire while fighting against it as a way of life in perpetuity. At bottom, the addict wants to be free of the pain that is elicited by desire. So he medicates his pain with this or that drug. But you can never really kill your desire. You can only redirect it. Because desire always entails a risk, an occasional failure, the addict suffers from an intolerance of the pain that the addiction momentarily relieves. This suggests that addiction is a form of suicide, which occasionally succeeds in the deliberate or accidental overdose, organ failure, obesity, waiting to die or hoping to. The same principle applies to any occasion when we galvanize the will to suppress the pain of desire, which is the pain of living. This is the most common circumstance that inspires a person to seek therapy. For some of us, our desire is so weak that all we have left is the will to carry on, but without joy. Having buried the desire, we nevertheless manage to eke out a measure of success driven by will alone. But are we happy? Will can sometimes lead to enviable wealth yet lead us wondering why our lives are devoid of passion. The irony is you don't really need drugs to reduce anxiety. Your will can do it for you. Will and desire, more often than not, are at cross purposes regarding how much risk we allow in our lives. Though will can be an instrument for change, more often it is not. To a surprising degree, will resist change. Genuine change only comes about when we want to change, not because we need to or because we should. Sartre's conception of psychic freedom is radical and disturbing to those among us who fear that our desire, who fear our desires and are anxious to manage them. Lang believed what is missing in our lives is opening our hearts to risk. Unfortunately, life occasions risk and fear is its greatest impediment. How much are we willing to risk is ultimately a matter of choice, however much we may wish that it wasn't. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, there are a lot of questions. So I just want to invite the the audience to sort of um, chime in. Um, I'll try to keep track of whoever wants to say something. And um, maybe I'll try to call on you. And um, basically, if you, you know, wave, <clears throat> I'll uh, note that um, if you put a question in the chat, I'll call, call on you. Um, I'll keep an eye on all of it. So is there anyone who would uh, like, to, like to start? Uh, 
Oh, Susanna. Yeah. And and you're muted, Susanna. Sorry. Um, uh, so if if you could, uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. This may be a, a way out there comment, but I work with art therapy and it's interesting all the, the points and the back and forth that you bring forward where the art making, it has an interesting tie into that notion of will and passion and what comes up from the unconscious. Um, it just seems to tie into a lot of what you're saying and is really encouraging for me to continue with the art making, which is more about spontaneous things coming up and then having clients notice what, what is that connected to in terms of their passion and their will. So thank you so much for reinforcing uh, this approach that makes sense for me in terms of what I'm attempting to do. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Susanna. Yeah, I would imagine uh, working with art would be very much uh, in, in lines with what we're talking about today. Um, and uh, Richard, I see you have your hand up. Just, yeah. Yes, thank you. Dr. Thompson, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very enlightening, and I hope that maybe your paper might be available. Uh, I've worked with addicts, alcoholics for over 30 years in clinical settings of all kinds. And I have noticed uh, in that uh, course of experience that uh, oftentimes when an alcoholic or addict, I'll use addict generically, um, has tried all of their self-control mechanisms to control their addiction, to no avail or to, you know, failing again and again. And it seems like it looks like from the outside, or maybe it's my interpretation, that they have to or have suffered a deflation of ego in order to come to a place where they're willing to accept the help to uh, change their lives. In the 12-step uh, program, they call it willingness. Um, I wonder if you've noticed that, and if according to this model, what would be the explanation for that phenomenon. Uh, so what you're suggesting is that they're struggling with the lack of ego and will rather than a preponderance of ego and will. Well, if, if you were to graph it, it would be sort of a curve where they've tried to exercise their willpower to a certain crescendo and it has collapsed. And then they've come down the other side with a sense of defeat and demoralization. Well, I, I use the uh, addiction metaphor uh, just as a kind of extreme example of something I think all of us struggle with all the time. Um, and that, you know, this notion of uh, impulses, wanting things that maybe are uh, dangerous for us, you know, that we can't seem to get enough of it. And uh, and also, as I was implying, I think that a lot of addictions are substitute for something else that we're not getting in life. And the obvious uh, uh, would be love. Uh, a lot of drugs give us a feeling of well being, uh, complacency, or freedom from depression or anxiety momentarily. Uh, and that, of course, is what lures us into. Uh, using um, a drug or, or gambling, any kind of activity that we might get uh, addicted to in that sense. Um, and Freud actually has a lot to say about uh, the relationship between addictions and uh, desires and will. Um, my, I guess my experience has been that um, in looking at all these uh, issues, is that um, yes, obviously you can try and stop yourself from a behavior or activity that you feel is self-destructive, even though you're very drawn to it. But what is it that accounts for success? What, why is it that some people do give up their addiction uh, and seem to uh, be at peace with that decision. Whereas other people keep struggling with that day after day after day and uh, never seem to feel that they've truly surmounted it, that they're always at risk of succumbing because the wish to engage in that behavior uh, is still 
with them. That's why um, I don't think uh, trying to force oneself, even if one has a weak will or ego, and some people have a much stronger one, is really the key to overcoming the addiction. Um, I think though that uh, just the fact that one is involved in a group setting or with other people uh, where that behavior has been um, arrested, uh, at least for a while, there's opportunities to redirect their life in other directions. That to me is the key to finally losing interest in the addiction because you can substitute something else for it. And that something else would be uh, our social lives, our relationships with other people. That's one reason AA uh, focuses so much on the group uh, experience because there you're having relationships with people that in some ways are substituting for the relationship with the addiction. And that's clearly a step in the right direction. And that's why I think AA does have quite a lot of success in helping people with this model. I think the argument that I'm making uh, is that uh, it's not willpower that explains uh, the successes when they occur. It's because of the redirection of, of their ability to get what they want from life. I don't know if that answered your, uh, your question, Richard. But, uh, uh, about 80%, but thank you. <laughs> okay. I'll take that. Well, and we have Richard Goldberg. And uh, just make sure to unmute yourself there, Richard. Um, uh, Richard, we Richard, we can't hear you. We, you need to uh, click on, there you go. Is that better? Yes. Okay, so- Hi, hi Richard. Uh, hi there, Michael. So my question is, I don't know where this came from, maybe somewhere deep in my unconscious, but um, the, the whole domain of what we call imagination, where would that fit into um, the idea of will and desire, if it does? Well, uh, of course, I think uh, imagining uh, does uh, have to figure in it somehow. You know, Sartre had a lot of things to say about imagination. He actually wrote a book on imagination. Um, uh, imagining is uh, really in a way of inventing. It's creating something new uh, in our minds. And, uh, and that leads to, you know, creating things in our lives. Uh, so uh, it's hard to imagine something new uh, when you're uh, living in terror or insurmountable pain. Uh, or depressed. Um, now it's true that a lot of artists, uh, very famous artists throughout history have suffered miserably and have uh, said that their art was what helped them survive. Uh, so their pain did not prevent them from imagining and creating. Uh, they even argued it might be an impetus for them doing that. Uh, I'm not so sure that it is an impetus for imagining and creativity. I, I think some people happen to be very creative and imaginative in spite of the pain that they're in, and that that's probably more likely why uh, some people are just gifted in that way more than others. Hmm. Okay. I think psychoanalysis to a large degree is a vehicle for imagining alternative ways of uh, dealing with our problems. Uh, there's so much focus placed on history, looking back at the past. I think there's, uh, while that's of course true, um, there's a risk in that of looking for causes in the past for why we have become the way that we are. And I was arguing today that um, I don't think things cause us to be the people that we are. Uh, we invent the way that we are. Uh, you could say that's a creative act or maybe an act of desperation. Um, but uh, anyway. 
Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, we have Danielle. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Danielle, if you uh, unmute yourself there. Okay. There you go. Um, Thank you, Michael. I was just wondering if you could say uh, a few words about Otto Rank, one of the analysts who uh, forefronted, you know, the the issue of will uh, in general and also in in psychoanalysis. Well, uh, of course, Rank was very influenced by Nietzsche, and uh, that's where he got this word "will," uh, will to power. Mm -hmm. Um, and he um, uh, brought a lot of Nietzsche's uh, thinking into the Freud's, you know, Wednesday circle at yeah. the uh, origins of the psychoanalytic uh, uh, training. Um, as an aside, uh, you know, a lot of people feel that uh, Freud owed a lot to Nietzsche. Um, Freud claimed never to have read him. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, he was present when Ronk was giving all of these lectures, uh, mm -hmm. so he didn't have to read him. <laughs> he he uh, slyly, you know, got it through Ronk. Yeah. Uh, Freud, their their thinking was so similar. Freud was really worried, uh, you know, that he would not get credit uh, for his theories. That everybody would uh, suggest he stole them uh, from Nietzsche. You know, Harold Bloom uh, wrote a whole book about the anxiety of influence about uh, people that are especially gifted often have this fear, you know, that somebody else anticipated their ideas, even though they weren't acquainted with them. Um, but, you know, Ronk had his particular way of interpreting Nietzsche and, and trying to integrate that into uh, psychoanalysis. Um, just as Jung had his way of taking uh, spiritual ideas and religious traditions, integrating that into psychoanalysis. Of course, there's a million ways that a, a given person could do that. Um, I've never particularly been drawn to Ronk's work, uh, but of course I did uh, read him and I thought that, uh, he, you know, it, super interesting. But could you say something about uh, Lang's uh, understanding of will in psychosis and in the uh, treatment of psychosis? Uh, well, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, Lang uh, uh, believed very much in psychoanalysis and existential philosophy. He was a Nietzsche uh, scholar, a Sartre scholar. Um, and he believed uh, very much in the uh, notion of indirection, you know, that you can't take something and grab it by the collar and force it, um, that we have to let these things sneak up on us. Mm. And, uh, and of course, uh, the idea of free associating in psychoanalysis epitomizes this notion that you, um, unlike CBT, uh, you're just uh, exploring your life and, and uh, the things that are happening in your life and sharing it with the person and trying to see how all of these things are connected in some way in, in your stuckness. Um, so whether you're treating psychosis or schizophrenia or neurosis or just unhappiness or malaise, the principle would be the same for everyone. Uh, that change comes about when we don't notice it. it and uh, so the way that people that lived in uh, Lang's houses, for example, mm -hmm. or were uh, in therapy with people involved with Lang, uh, it would be exactly the same principle. You're just trying to make a connection with people to get them to open up to you. And that process of opening up and sharing and being comfortable of being uh, intimate with other people uh, is itself healing. Yeah. And, uh, and that that's much more the healing agent than insights, let's say, into this or that incident in our past. Uh, we have to spend a lot of time in therapy talking 
it's, what are we going to talk about, you know? Uh, so naturally we have to talk about something and, uh, but in a way that's uh, secondary to the process of being engaged with another person in, in a very special way. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. So we have um, Marisol, um, I see you wrote a question there. Would, uh, would you like to say that or and then trevor i think is next after marisol um yeah marisol you're welcome to read it or uh if, if i don't see you at so what she's asking is um how does freud's concept of super ego or conscience fit into the discussion regarding will and desire well that's a good question uh uh of course you know remember that um, Freud once characterized this uh, structural model of the unconscious id, ego, superego as a fiction. Uh, there aren't literally three components to our heads that are vying with each other, you know, um, it's a metaphor. And uh, so the ego and the superego are very closely intertwined. Uh, the, he defines the superego as all of the moral views of our parents that we've interjected and adopted as our own. And that sometimes these can be um, antithetical to the things that we desire in life. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Jacques Lacan uh, pretty much dispenses with the notion of a superego uh, because he feels that the ego is really the superego. It's, it's the culprit in this thing and that it's really comes down to the tension between desiring and willing. Uh, uh, another thing I would add about the ego is that that is the seat of all of our defense mechanisms and it's the seat of all of our anxieties. So uh, you have desire, and then you have the fear of our desire, and that's the tension that we all live with throughout our lives, um, and uh, how the two interact with each other. Uh, what is our relationship to fear? Uh, what, why do we avoid anything that is risky uh, when we know that we have to take a risk uh, in order to achieve anything in life, uh, we risk failure, we risk humiliation, we risk loss. Um, so uh, the superego is just an extension of this idea uh, that uh, it's a prohibition, basically, uh, that we shouldn't want this and shouldn't want that. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, psychoanalysts would tend to agree that uh, you want to diminish the power that the superego has over you in order to get rid of the guilt, you know, that lies at the bottom of uh, our inhibitions. That did that answer your question? And that was Marisol. So, um, yeah. Uh, oh, are you Marisol? No. Okay. So, um, yeah, she she's listening, I imagine. So, um, uh, I think you mentioned, oh, Marisol says thank you. <laughs> uh, so, um, did you, uh, were you saying that Trevor was next? Trevor had his hand up. Is that right, Trevor? Oh, and uh, Trevor, you, uh, you seem to be unmuted, but I can't hear you. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, maybe a microphone issue. Yeah, I see. Yeah, it seems not to be working, Trevor. Unfortunately, we can we can hear you. Uh, maybe, we can see you. The, maybe it's the chat room. His uh, volume? Maybe his volume has to go up. No, it's not his volume. It would be a, a setting on his microphone, most likely. So, um, it might be connected to the wrong microphone. But if you'd like to write it in the chat, you're welcome to do that. And uh... all these technical. So we'll uh, go Randy, back. Is that Randy Weingarten? Hey. Yes, it is. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for the clarity of this uh, review of uh, uh, will and desire. It's extremely uh, useful. 
I have been thinking a lot lately uh, about empathy, the role of empathy in all forms of psychotherapy and analytical work, and um, particularly the, the way in which it is useful uh, in its own way, in its own particular way, and uh, particularly when there is a quality of kindness that surrounds this, this relational experience. And I, I was wondering if that's something that, that can be chosen, that, that, you, um, that you choose to be this particular way, or is it something that, that sort of befalls us in the context of doing the work that we do? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Randy. I, I'm super interested in the question of empathy. Um, in fact, uh, you know, Max Scheler, uh, the uh, German philosopher who was a student of uh, Husserl's, uh, wrote a book on um, sympathy, oh. mm -hmm. uh, which is fascinating, where, where he's distinguishing between sympathy and empathy. Yes. And his argument, I, I think today we tend to equate them. You know, uh, the empathic person is a sympathic person. His argument was that um, actually uh, empathy is a gift uh, where you have uh, this intuitive connection with another person uh, where you can uh, pick up non-verbally uh, perhaps feelings that that person is experiencing uh even thoughts although that gets pretty tricky um and yet that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sympathetic to the person that you're picking up these uh thoughts from a good example of that would be paranoia mm -hmm. uh, the paranoid person is super empathic uh, he's not just imagining that people are out to get him. He is picking up on things uh, that's coming from other people, maybe exaggerating it, you know, because there's uh, uh, usually a psychotic component to paranoia. Um, but the person who, uh, and let's hope that therapists are usually empathic people, <laughs> um, but also sympathic people that, uh, you know, where you can feel another person's pain and your heart really goes out to them. Um, and uh, sometimes you feel another person's pain and your heart may not go out to them. You may resent them. Uh, you know, that would be a lack of sympathy. Uh, now, sympathy is one of our words, I think, for love, isn't it? It's... Uh, it's the same word as compassion. Um, uh, you know, to be with another person in our feelings. And um, so why is it that some of us are more loving than others? Uh, and I think that would be the same question. Why are some of us more empathic and more sympathic? Uh, I don't think we have, of course, any control over the degree to which we are able to love people. Uh, but I do like to think that uh, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis are opportunities to become more loving, yes. uh, you know, in this indirect way of, of this special engagement with another person um, and trying to get to the bottom of why we're so anxious or in so much pain. You know, uh, as I think I did mention earlier, uh, fear is the greatest enemy to desire, and I would, of course, add the greatest enemy to love. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to love when you're uh, scared out of your wits. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there is some correlation there. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, can. Can we train people to be more empathic? Um, I'm not so sure. We, we might be able to train ourselves, you know, if, if we uh, if we know what's holding us back from that. But it, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? What, what do you think about that, Randy? Well, I think of the person who asked about the role of the imagination, uh, that uh, that that might be a way in which to cultivate more empathy for people 
uh, in the course of teaching, for example, whether or not, uh, or in, in various kinds of uh, different forms of therapy, let's say like marital therapy or family therapy, that there can be opportunities to encourage, to encourage this sometimes by using the imagination, um, uh, by using the honesty of one's uh, feeling. I think you mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think you're, you're, this whole discussion about will and desire and choice is, is such a fundamental element here in psychotherapy and analysis and, and how related it is to the use of empathy, for example, as a, um, as a way of connecting, but also the, the whole question of whether or not it can actually be transforming. It, it can have that kind of quality as well. I, I don't know, I'm just uh -huh, uh -huh. trying to evolve a, a better, more clarity about it. Well, as Lang once uh, said very often, uh, we're always flying by the seat of our pants. You know? <laughs> uh, we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, we're just kind of feeling our way you know, in each situation and doing our best. Um, but maybe what you just said, Randy, made me think about meditation practices. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, that is also a vehicle for people to become more open, yes. more loving, you know, to sit with something, you know, maybe meditate uh, for years on why am I such an angry person? You know, that, that's a good one to ponder. Mm -hmm. uh, how does a person become less angry? Uh, Boy, if I knew the answer to that one, I'd be a zillionaire. <laughs> Thank you. That Thanks, was, Randy. That was a great right. conversation. So I want to uh, circle back to Trevor, who was able to type in his question. Um, he's asked, uh, he says, my question was on the superego and will as well. The superego is not just conscience and prohibition, but it is also the ego ideal. Mm. Then he says, um, one more important function remains to be mentioned, which we attribute to this superego. It is also the vehicle of the ego ideal by which the ego measures itself, which it emulates and whose demand forever uh, greater perfection it strives to fulfill. And that's a a quotation from Freud. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks for that, Trevor. I, I love the uh, Freud's notion of the ego ideal. Actually, the superego replaces uh, the ego ideal, which is a very early theory in Freud's. And I think uh, at a loss, um, my, my understanding of the ego ideal, this had something to do with um, Freud's blueprint for happiness, where he posits that here, first there's the ego, which he's saying is the self in, in this context, the person I am. And then there's the ego ideal, which is the person I wish to be, that I aspire to be. So that would account for ambition. You know, I wanna be an astronaut when I grow up and I wanna get married. I see myself as a father and a husband or whatever. Uh, and I uh, aim toward achieving this. And there's always a gap between the ego and the ego ideal. Uh, you know, so let's say I decide to go to graduate school and this is gonna take me years uh, of cost and frustration and effort. And, uh, and then I start uh, beginning to wonder, well, do I really wanna do this? I mean, it's causing so much aggravation. I'm not doing that well. Um, um, I may abandon that ego ideal uh, or I may stick with it and try harder to accomplish it. And Freud's uh, thesis about this is that uh, we do have that choice when uh, when the gap is wide between who I am and who I want to be 
uh, I'm either going to end up abandoning that ideal or I'm going to have to work even harder and sacrifice even more to accomplish it. And uh, ultimately, that gap has to be closed. So the closer the gap between the ego and the ego ideal, Freud is suggesting the happier we are. The wider the gap, the unhappier. Now, he felt that um, uh, the person that he's calling the neurotic doesn't like that choice. Give it up or try harder. And uh, he opts for a third choice, which Freud calls a magical choice. And that is the neurotic symptom. He develops anxiety or depression or all kinds of, you know, all these kinds of symptoms that we're too familiar with. And, and that uh, becomes uh, where ambivalence is located so that you can't really choose one or the other. You're just kind of stuck in this place where you can't really get anywhere with it. And that's how he characterizes the neurotic conflict. Um, all that kind of gets lost later when he develops the structural model and he doesn't talk about the ego ideal so much anymore. He talks about the id, ego, and super ego. And, and you know, I think uh, I agree with you. They're not the same thing entirely. But I wouldn't say that the super ego has all of those qualities that the ego ideal did. You know, Freud's thinking is um, so complex. And, and, you know, you're talking about 23 volumes of... Um, books and collected papers, et cetera. I mean, who's read all of that? Um, and, uh, and you know, he's changed his, his view constantly as he's going along, uh, seemingly replacing one thing with another and sometimes holding on to some of the earlier ideas like the topographical model, the structural model. He, he never completely abandons the topographical model and he never completely abandoned the idea of an ego ideal, although in his theories, it got displaced by the superego. It's what I love about Freud. <laughs> now, Very good uh, question. Thank you. So uh, the next comment I see here is uh, from David Goldberg, a quote from Kierkegaard. Um, is David here? Uh, David, do you want to jump in with that? Hi, thank you so much for the presentation, Michael. Beautifully done. Um, really illuminating and, and helps me. I appreciate the Schopenhauer um, description. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention more about, uh, more about Otto Rank. Um, he, he, one of his most, more famous books is Will Therapy. And um, it, it's really stunning to see how much uh, Rank and Kierkegaard's thought really are uh, similar. Uh, and I think Rank wrote in a time before Kierkegaard was fully, uh, you know, um, understood and read. Uh, but 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 Rank, uh, for what it's worth, put, puts Will really at the, the center of his, you know, idea of, of of therapy, and 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 seems to place it in in, in the ego. If I'm blending some theories, mm -hmm. seems to place it in in, in our consciousness, and mm -hmm. he seems to suggest that the 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 seat of our creativity is the will and that therapy the goal of therapy for auto rank is not to release sexuality but to release creativity that for rank i think would be his therapeutic ideal um thinking of people especially um, inhibited people um i think rank would call those um negative willing uh, people who are not able to um in, in, uh, use their will to 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 satisfy their desires or or know what they want but feel too inhibited to go there i think rank would call that negative willing um but but uh anyways i'm i'm, I'm just saying a few things about auto rank i just wanted to add that add to those ideas because his his theories certainly uh, uh talk about will a good deal well that's really interesting uh, david uh i did know that he had a connection with Kierkegaard. Um, but I, I 
I'm just wondering um, if he's saying that it's up to the will to make change um, and that he's equating that with the ego. How is that psychoanalytic? Well, it's a great question. And, and, and I think Otto Rank would say it's not. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. <laughs> Otto Rank broke with Freud. Okay. And uh, there, and, and and went away from you know sexuality as the bedrock, and went towards uh, this idea of will, and 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 much more towards the the kind of the the here and now of the transference. You know, he's considered one of the more existentially influenced uh, psychoanalysts mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because of that focus on the present moment, mm -hmm. because of the focus on the, the the patient being the center of the action, not the analyst and the analyst quote unquote narcissism, thinking everything's about them. Um, uh -huh. so rank was really ahead of his time in, 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 in these ways. Um, so that, yeah, that would be my, my, my thoughts. That's, that's interesting. Uh, and he, didn't he coined the inferiority complex and, uh, superiority um, complex? He, he, uh, you know, um, that might've that been Adler. Young. I was think that Adler. Young. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get Adler and, well, and Adler Ron too. mixed yeah. up. Um, uh rock with that great book on don juan didn't he uh the don juan complex uh mm -hmm. which i thought was a remarkable effort um well you know i have to say my heart breaks uh whenever i start thinking about uh philosophy and psychoanalysis uh i i can't count how many heidegger scholars uh, that I know and, and, and acquainted with and have uh, uh, conversations with about the relationship between the two disciplines. And almost with, uh, with no exception, they hate psychoanalysis. Uh, and they love cognitive therapies and believe that existential philosophy interpreted as a treatment would be cognitive therapy, not psychodynamic. And uh, there's some weird block there that I cannot fathom uh, what it's about. That's not true of every single philosopher. Um, I, I do know some who, uh, who do see psychoanalysis as very compatible with existential uh, thinking. Uh, but I, I don't get it. And maybe that was something that Ronk uh, struggled with, you know, that he um, uh, took Nietzsche and, uh, and Kierkegaard uh, in a more conscious, ego-driven context. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Nietzsche certainly did not equate um, uh, will with ego. Mm -hmm. So go figure. You know. mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, no, I, uh, if there aren't any hands, I, I think uh, Sandy has been making, oh, oh, and uh, Jim, I see you there too. So maybe we'll do Sandy and then Jim, uh, if Sandy, if you wanted to say anything, I, you've been uh, putting things in the, in the chats, um, if you wanted to make any comment on any of those. Um, or, or maybe he's away at the moment, so. No, I'm here. I just need to push, push the right button. Okay. Um, I don't know if I did or not. Let's see. There I did. We can hear you. Yeah. We can hear you, Sandy. Uh, hi, Michael. Uh, hey. Great paper. I love some of the things you were pointing out. I, I sent you in a chat, but I don't know if you got the message. Uh, James Hillman, in his uh, work, uh, wrote a book called Healing Fiction in which he essentially postulates that therapy is essentially rooted in creating a hermeneutical situation which a fiction is created based on what the patient has brought into the sessions and that the goal is to allow them through this act to see themselves in a healthier situation. Uh, I think that applies to CBT and many of the other things that you've been mentioning. And I was wondering what you thought Lang might think of such a, an attitude as seeing therapy as a, a essentially a, a hermeneutical act. 
Well, of course, it's all about hermeneutics. Uh, um, that's, uh, I guess that term has taken on a life of its own. Um, uh, you know, Heidegger is uh, hermeneutical, although he did uh, mm -hmm. seem to abandon his earlier uh, preoccupation with hermeneutics. Gadamer, of course, built his whole philosophy around hermeneutics. Um, Phil Cushman, who uh, you know, died recently, was uh, very, very much a Gadamer devotee and uh, built his whole therapy practice around hermeneutics. Um, but sure, yeah, of course, uh, Lang would have been wholeheartedly in agreement. And I know that Lang admired Hillman's uh, work very, very much. Thanks. I, I, that's why I thought it would be useful to add to the thought, thought about will, which is yes. essentially uh, uh, the, the, what you were laying out brilliantly was a different um, interpretive ways people can incorporate their concepts of will and how they imagine it might impact their lives well you know when you consider that um psychoanalysis really starts with interpretation mm. uh not explanation yes and that's the decisive difference isn't it once you interpret you're going through indirect means of getting at something you're not just grabbing it by the collar and um and that's what i think uh uh hermeneutics is about, isn't it? Even uh, hermeneutic uh, uh, interpretation of religious texts has a similar principle. You know, you're trying to get at the truth buried in there. It's not so obvious. Yes. And there are many truths buried there, not just one. Yeah, we don't want to confuse people with that though, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Andy. That's great. So uh, maybe we have time just for one more. And I you know, Jim, you wanted to say something there. So. Yeah, just in response to your uh, comment about uh, philosophers. I mean, philosophers are extreme thinking types. And psychoanalysis is is first about uh, relationship. And and I was, I was wondering about, you know, maybe we've actually already covered this, but the notion of surrender, which is kind of the opposite of a uh, will to power and it's and I'm thinking about again we're talking about um, the 12 steps and the surrendering to the higher power uh, but it's also just entering into the therapeutic relationship is a surrender of of sorts and I don't know if that's a useful kind of connection oh absolutely uh I have agreed completely, uh, Jim, with with that comment. Um, Me too. I I, uh, I want to back up a bit and uh, respond to what you said about philosophers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not all. Uh, yes, philosophy uh, we think of basically as a very rational, cognitive kind of uh, way of using the mind. Uh, rational in the hyper sense of the word. Um, but that's not always uh, the case. Uh, Aristotle uh, distinguishes between two types of thinking. Uh, calculative thinking, which is what most philosophers do, and um, contemplative thinking was the other word that he used, which uh, is very similar to Heidegger. I think Heidegger got this from Aristotle. He talks about calculative thinking and meditative thinking. And the two are totally different. Mm. Uh, so I think psychoanalysts are inviting us to think in a more meditative way, not okay. so much in a rational, cognitive way. And uh, there's a rich tradition, uh, you may be familiar with it, Jim, in, in Western philosophy of skepticism. Uh, and more specifically, the Peronian skeptics that goes back to the days of Alexander the Great, um, which is all about uh, this idea of surrendering the mind to thinking indirectly and more meditatively, not making judgments, hmm. uh, trying to get rid of the notion that we know what's going on and that we have the answers. We're inquiring. And the word skeptic means inquire. 
uh, a lot of people think it means to doubt. It's not about doubting. It's, it's if you don't know the answer, you're always looking for it. And the true skeptic was always searching for the truth and never found it. And that's very Nietzsche, that's very Heidegger. There's a rich tradition throughout the history of Western philosophy that is indebted to the Peronian skeptics to this day. And existentialists and phenomenologists are the uh, most recent additions of that influence. That's why it surprises me that a Heideggerian scholar <laughs> who's supposed to be rooted in this stuff, you know, skeptic doubting or questioning, can be super dogmatic, you know, about uh, things like psychotherapy uh, mm. and not get it, not see the connection. Uh, so, um, and, uh, and also, of course, Beyond makes a, uh, says a lot about uh, not knowing, you know, erasing memory and desire and understanding when you come into the consulting room, treat every session like it's the first one, you're just trying mm -hmm. to get your bearings uh, that's all skeptic sensibility. And uh, unfortunately, it's uh, in the minority of how therapists think. Thank you. That's very interesting. I think that's where the art therapy can come in, too, is that uh -huh. skeptic approach of you're entering into the unknown, the white space in front of you, if you're, if it's visual art, is the unknown, and we need to go into the unknown in order to find any knowns, and so that, that sometimes can almost be a compulsion, I mean, in a generative way of stepping into the unknown, because you know you're going to bump into something, just by the nature of making a mark, finding a color, what the relationships of those are, and then the imagination and the association start to mm -hmm. weave in a certain narrative, and then we can consider narrative in terms of Hillman's healing fictions. And so on and so forth. Very exciting. Oh, you talk. Yeah, and, and of course, Jung it was very important to Jung, wasn't it? I mean, he uh, Freud believed that you had to uh, tell your dreams because for him, it was all about the language that you use to describe a dream. Uh, and he's more interested in the language that you're using than the imagery. Whereas Jung encouraged patients to paint their dreams, yes. uh, you know, yeah. uh, and, uh, and that's, yeah, that's rich stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.